Just think of it as the rough draft of the podcast world. This is the Newbie Writers Podcast with your hosts, Damian Boat and Catherine Bramcamp. Hey, it's episode 187. And was that really loud? No, it was okay. Oh, you were okay. That blew my head off. Hang on. <laughs> right. Anyway, good to see you. I, I'm having one of those mornings, I think. You know, you get up and you think, oh, it's going to be a pretty average morning. So, yep. you know, hopefully we can turn it around in the next two minutes. In the so, next two minutes and make it really interesting because we have a very interesting mm. guest, Brooke Warner from She Writes Press. And I'm really excited about having you here, Brooke. Thank you for coming on with us. Thank you for having me. Have oh, we had someone pleasure. on from She Writes once before? I can't remember. It sounds very familiar. Oh, it's because uh, Betsy Fassbinger had her book uh, published by She Writes Press. Right. Well, there you go. Yeah, and and we were like, Betsy was like all over it, like, oh, it's fabulous. It's the best thing that ever happened to me, et cetera, et cetera, just to give her a little shout out for you, Brooke. <laughs> and, and that's why you Love brings to hear that. So, Yeah, so I thought I'd bring in, I, the, I thought I'd bring in the person responsible for such a cool uh, publishing venue. Cool. Well, remind me about She Writes. There's no okay, men. So there's no men us, in there, is yeah, there? Yeah, tell us about it. Um, don't don't trust me. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, she writes. Press is a hybrid publishing company, so it is an interesting model. But it's a model that I think we will continue to see increasingly popping up everywhere because the traditional way of publishing is very difficult to sustain, and people who follow publishing know that the little publishers get eaten up by the big publishers and it's very difficult to make it as an independent publisher today and the way that the hybrid models are working is that they're taking creative elements from traditional publishing and self-publishing and kind of melding them together so we are decidedly not a self-publishing company but the author invests up front and they get a much higher percentage of their royalty return on the tail end so in that sense they're like author entrepreneurs and on the other side of things where we're more like traditional is that we curate our list. So we vet all of the projects. We have a very high editorial standard. And importantly, we have traditional distribution. And so it really truly is a hybrid kind of this mix of all things. And the authors have a lot of control. Uh, I think we have gorgeous covers, if I may say so myself, and that does set us apart as well. So it's this blend and interesting model. And we're not the only ones out there um, by any means. And it's I would say the wave of the publishing future. So when when are you gonna when are you gonna start he writes? <laughs> People ask me that all the time. We own the URL. We just need a publisher. <laughs> oh right. So you've actually done that. Mm. Well, well we well, thought, thought of about it. it. Thought about it ahead. <laughs> it's crossed our mind, but we 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 would need another publisher to take that on because we have more than we can handle with the women. Oh. And then you need to have kid rights and dog rights. And... <laughs> All of it. We we write. We have all these things, but we we just gotta leverage. Oh, curse right the there. internet for cheap domains. Put it that way. <laughs> so, she writes has been, and and you're right. I think that um, the books that I have held in my hands from from your company have been gorgeous. I mean, they're 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 beautiful covers. Everything looks really top notch. What do you? Um, attribute that to you know what sets uh, she writes apart from some of the others and we won't name them but I can I can think of a couple off the top of my own head um, what sets you apart do you think you know why well, why are, I mean, why am I getting like you know I talk to the authors and they rave and I yeah and I look at the books and I think oh these are just awesome what what's, what's your what's your angle what, why are you so awesome <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean good taste is part of it I think that I come out of the the book publishing industry I did that for 14 years before I started she writes press and mm -hmm. I co-founded it with Kami Wyckoff who's the founder of she so we had this 
a social media platform and we built a publishing company on top of it. And so uh -huh. there, we already had a good brand. Um, I think there, there was a lot that was already working. And then to bring the publishing know-how, I mean, what's happening right now in publishing, I think, is that a lot of media people uh, are getting into publishing or a lot of people who just see it as, ooh, that's a great way to make money and they don't really understand the inner workings of publishing and so I always feel that you have to be a, or not you have to be but you should be a publishing professional to understand what makes books work because it's somewhat um, I mean like I said earlier it's about good taste so our creative director our interior designers they're talented and you have all these people who are wanting to do template publishing mm -hmm. like well, just plug in your design here. And I right. don't think that makes for beautiful books. It certainly doesn't make for artisanal, gorgeous, unique books. Yeah. Yeah. So Catherine wants to end up on the um, on your list, I think. Excellent. I'm Submit. <laughs> I'm just getting a bit of echo from you. Are you able to turn yeah, your PC down a bit? Or your computer? I can turn mine down. Coming from my end? I think so, yes. There I, we go. You want me to turn down the volume? Just a little bit if you can. Awesome. That'll do. There you go. Thanks. So we've got the, um, you know, I think artis artisanal is a good word um, that I can't pronounce. Okay. Um, we've, got, we've got the hybrid publishing. Tell us a little bit about, because um, I just, I, I read an interesting and well-written blog about the idea of book returns. And I don't think sometimes authors quite, or newbie writers definitely, quite understand what that, what the whole bookstore almost scam is. Can you, can you explain a little bit about that whole return thing that, that can really bite people without them realizing that this is what's going to go down? Yeah, and it's an interesting thing because some newbie authors, when they're self-publishing, they don't even make their book returnable. They think, oh, well, I'll just go around that completely and set my book to be non-returnable. But if you do that, the bookstores don't want to take you. So it's, right. there's a lot of things moving on. So let me see if I can... Uh, talk about it in a sequence that will make sense to people. Essentially, it's a holdover from the Great Depression that the book industry is a returns-based industry, which means that it's a consignment business. You mm -hmm. give your book to the bookstore, they sell what they can sell, and whatever they don't sell, they return to you, the author, or to the publisher, or more likely to the distributor. It is our distributor who processes our returns for us. So what you have is this system whereby the bookstores basically only have to buy or pay for what they sell. And so in that sense, I think you're right, it is kind of scammy. I mean, I don't think it started out that way, but it is so ingrained and so expected that the idea that you might change it, of course, is met with great resistance from the bookstore owners, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it's kind of like, you because know, I used to work in retail, and, and it's like, oh, this, my, my husband owned a re retail um, bicycle store. Oh, this bike isn't selling, so I'm just going to send it back to you, and you're going to give me all my money back. Oh, well, it wouldn't even occur to us. In a, of in course. A in a it's so low bike. risk on the part of the bookstore buyers. Zero. Yeah, zero. And, and so they're, of course, loath to change the process, and understandably, but of course on the author side, there are a lot of ramifications, and as authors are getting more into self-publishing, or in our case, where they're investing in themselves, they're uh -huh. seeing the great fallout from the returns, because you yeah. have to absorb those costs yourself, whereas in the past, the publisher has always absorbed those costs and written them off as losses, in a way that a big company can take and, and, and individuals can't. Yeah. Well, even small publishers, my publisher, um, Damnation Press, does not do returns. They couldn't handle it. It almost, it almost bankrupted them. So, you know, so they, they focus mainly on, on electronic outlets, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble Online, that kind of thing, as opposed to trying to get in the bookstores and have it all washed back at them. And it's a hard situation because for our authors, the bookstore venues are really positive venues. They're getting oh. 
coverage. Who doesn't love bookstores? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's kind of like I love bookstores. I'm, I'm, but at the same time, I'm like, wow, this is like crazy that you can say, oh, this didn't work. Back at you. Absolutely. And so that's, it's an interesting place where I think authors get caught because like you're saying, okay, well, my publisher is opting out completely. And if you opt out completely, you in essence are opting out of being carried in bookstores. And yes. for a lot of authors, they feel that their legitimacy is tied up in their ability to be carried in bookstores or to have events in bookstores. And especially because we have a lot of commercial and literary fiction, those authors in particular have a lot riding on their books capacity to be in bookstores so yeah. I think it's a it's a tricky space and we feel that it's an offering that we have to get the books into bookstores but the returns issue is a big one hmm. um, it's expensive just out of curiosity yeah. do you have two trains crashing into each other behind you <laughs> <laughs> I live uh, five blocks from the train track so I hope that will be the only train to go by this hour <laughs> but it could be the first of many it's funny though I just maybe the train driver's really pissed off today <laughs> he's like get off the track <laughs> they're very horn happy here well, they're very horny that's what you can <laughs> very say. Horny. she did not say that though I'm she not said that. I am not putting words in anyone's mouth <laughs> My God. So what do you see as, um, so you've got a new, you know, a new author, he or she sends their book into you, got into She Writes Press, and you say, you vet it, and you say, yeah, you know, this, this will work. Understanding, of course, that you're looking at it as a product that can be purchased, that, that can be sold, whereas a writer often looks at their work as something that is, you know, from their heart and is, you know, is, is like their perfect child and, and they, you know, there's, there's that dichotomy. But um, once an author is accepted, what is, the, what is the process and can you give us a general idea of how much investment an author makes when they go into a hybrid uh, contract? Yeah, and it's important. An important thing that you note there is the how we base uh, our submissions policy is really based on merit and on the writing, and not so much on whether or not it's a marketable product. And that's oh, so wow. different than traditional publishing, of course, because I came out of traditional publishing and was. Act, frankly somewhat distraught by how often I was having to reject really well written fantastic books because the marketing team didn't feel that they could sell through whatever that threshold number was that they felt they needed to sell and wow. And so traditional publishing is very much, of course, product driven. They're investing in the product. That makes sense. Right. It's their business model and their losses. In our model, we can take on a book that is a gorgeously written literary book that maybe isn't going to sell in the way that a traditional publisher would need it to sell. And the author comes in understanding that. And okay. it is their risk to bear under those circumstances. So we are not asking for any kind of marketing plan. Uh, we are simply saying if your book passes the, the editorial test, then we okay. will publish you. So that's an important piece of our model. And then with regard to after that, right, you get, you get accepted. Um, we assess the level of editorial that we think the book needs, whether that's a copy edit or a proofread. We discuss that with the author. And uh -huh. then we encourage the authors to hire an outside publicist. So that is an aspect of our model that has shifted over time. And because of the uh, distribution arrangement with Ingram, the hard uh -huh. thing is that if you're going to do a um, a print run and you're going to get into bookstores, you really have to have the marketing support behind the book for the book to sell through. Uh -huh. uh, and that's the difference between selling through and just selling in is that this is where the, we go back to the returns, right? The bookstores may say, okay, great, we'll take like maybe Barnes and Noble, Noble will take a uh, hundred, and Amazon will take fifty, and all these other little bookstores will take between one and five. Right. But that's yeah. basically just a an order. Mm -hmm. But you have to fulfill the order, mm -hmm. and then they will come back. And so sell through is what is referred to as like the gold, right? That's when customers right. actually buy the book. Uh -huh. And you, you're not going to get that sell-through if you don't have any marketing or publicity. Right. 
So our authors are hiring publicists, and that is outside of what they pay to publish. So the venture, you know, for a lot of the authors is not an, an inexpensive one. Our package is $4,900 to publish, and then people are spending anywhere from five, you know, upwards of $10,000 for publicity. So on the low end, authors are spending $10,000 for everything and on the high end they're spending more than that so it's it, it's a it's a major investment in self yeah. and yet we're on the low end for cost for hybrid publishers huh. have you ever had it where it sort of backfired a bit on an author where they've spent all that money and then no one is really interested uh, I mean no one is a uh, a word that we'd have to talk about because <laughs> the, yeah. there's always some interest, right? I mean, mm. there the, the books, all of them are selling something, and okay. so and our our rates of sell through are much higher than self publishing rates of sell through, and then we have some fantastic success stories. But of course, because we published, we have about 150 authors mm -hmm. so far. Um, there absolutely is, you know, all along there are the people who have sold very little and there are people who have sold a lot but there are also people who don't hire publicists you know who say oh, well I'm gonna do it on my own or I don't want to invest in marketing and so they are spending much less in terms of their investment but absolutely I mean it, it's it's a gamble and publishing is a gamble it's just that it used to be the publishing houses who are taking the gamble on the writers and now more and more so writers are taking the gamble on themselves have you ever had a submission come in where you've looked at it and you've just gone really um and you've taken it to the others in She Writes and said, look at this. This is a train wreck. How can we let this person down generally? I, I don't have to do that at She Writes, luckily, because we just simply have a track. And if that person is not ready to publish and is so far off base, we give them an assessment and we get to tell them why. Mm. At Seal, where I used to work as an acquiring editor, and I that person thought they were ready to get a publishing deal in an advance, then yes, I, I would say I was guilty of having done that a couple of times. <laughs> how, does, how does your rejection letter start? Dear author, it has come to our attention that you can't write. And that... <laughs> always been a very gentle handed uh, rejection writer <laughs> trying to find the best in things and encourage them to work with an editor or a coach to improve their writing but people absolutely are self delusional about the level of uh, that the level they're at mm. that people often think they're ready to publish when they're very far from it well I, I can't submit but if Catherine submits can you just respond back with look it's not you it's me <laughs> started... I'll, I'll totally do that for you. Awesome. Just... <laughs> started off well, that way. It's not you, it's me. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and agents do that all the time. You know, they're so gentle. They'll say things like, this is a very subjective industry, and I don't like it, but you might find luck elsewhere. Uh, you always see those sort of like you know, trying to back into it nicely. But the fact is, it's true. Yeah. You, you might, I mean, not all across the board, of course, there's there's not good writing, but there are things that work for some people and not for others. But have we yeah. become too soft? Has it become a thing of, oh, we don't want to crush their spirit? That was terrible. They clearly copied from Wikipedia or something, you know. <laughs> There's well, and that's be. why I think vetting is so important because mm. we're not soft because our brand is on the line. Traditional publishing isn't soft because they don't want to put something out that they can't sell. And so what is going to end up happening, I think, is that the the self-publishing is is going to really contract, you know, and the only people who are going to be self-publishing, I think not now, but down the road, will be authors who... Um, I don't know. I, uh, so to rephrase that, I guess you're going to start to see it differentiate more. You know, mm. this middle ground of publishing of people who really want to do it well and be taken seriously and professionally, I think, are going to be able to make a space for themselves in the middle ground. Mm. Okay. That's, think... that's my prediction for the future. Mm. You sort of see that a little bit already where, you know, Amazon's flooded with those people that are just like, well, I've just published this in the afternoon or I wrote this book yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, oh my God, you laugh. Seminars. I follow them on Google+. Plus. Yeah, there's seminars and classes too. And I, I haven't gotten a grip on what I want to say about this, but it, it always amuses me to see are, are the two things that I've seen recently is one, 
write a best-selling book with no words at all. <laughs> yeah, it's called copying. <laughs> Which I believe are, it's the coloring books, I'm sure. <laughs> and then the other is you know, write your novel in a weekend. And I thought, okay, okay, even Jack Kerouac took seven days. So how are we going to... How are you going to do that? And what kind of quality are we talking about? Um, along those lines, um, how Brooke, how do you think, you know, with that middle ground, with people publishing themselves or, you know, spending some time and energy to make sure their books are good, um, how, are, how are readers going to be able to pre-vet books? I, you know, you have so many uh, self-published books that are either, they could be great, but they could also be pretty awful. How is the you know, what can the reader do to to make sure that they're spending their time in a worthwhile way with worthwhile writing? Well, I think that's why reviews continue to be so important, and there are a lot of really valuable review sites out there that people trust, and they read specifically for discoverability. There are all of these websites now where people are sharing with one another. Obviously, Goodreads is the most uh, well-known, but there are smaller Goodreads-style platforms where people are sharing with one another about what they love. And then you, tools like Search Inside the Book, I think, continue to be valuable because as an avid reader, I know that I'm hooked within two, three pages. It doesn't take that long to go, wow, this is really gripping me. And that's the kind of attention that editors and agents and, again, you know, just people who read a lot pay to a book. And so you don't have that much time. And yeah. th those are all discoverability tools. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that part of that, um, and this is, this is not a new conversation, this is, I think, a good seven or eight years, um, because we have Amazon, and because we have that ability, you know, take a look, you know, take a look inside. Um, do you think it's changed how writers approach their stories and how they create? I've even heard, you know, don't put a table of contents in the front of your book because if someone's only looking for three or four pages, that you want to give them the book. So it's almost it's changed the actual physical structure of how you put a book together. Do you think that that's true? Have you seen that? I think what you're saying is true on the ebook side, on the people who are a little bit more gimmicky. I definitely have seen lots of people trying to sell stuff, so they'll put their offer right up front or no table of contents or, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. But I, back to the point of what we're trying to do is really honor the integrity of traditional publishing. And I think that most people who long to be published in in the way that they have sort of grown up seeing publishing want yeah. all of those traditional standards in place so yeah. not every book okay. needs to have a table of contents for instance but I think there are lots of people taking a lot of liberties with book publishing who have no idea what they're doing and they are you know they're they're sort of the ones who are mucking it up for other people Okay. Um, and I, I really believe strongly that there's a legacy that we need to uphold. And it's because I come out of traditional publishing. I mean, I really do honor it. And there's a lot wrong with traditional publishing. But I think that it's the gold standard and that people who are, whether they're self-publishing or whatever you're doing, that you should be adhering to that and be trying to publish a book that looks like any other book that's ever existed. Well, here's a, here's a really dumb newbie question. I've often wondered this. In fiction books, why do we need a table of contents that just shows the chapter titles? <laughs> I mean, really, if you, you're going to read the story, I've never, ever picked up a book off the shelf and gone, you know what, I might start at chapter <laughs> five. <laughs> Absolutely. And and most novels don't need to have tables of contents and many don't. And it's dependent on the author sometimes. Sometimes people just like that element for whatever reason, but that is for sure a an optional element. Hmm. I just see in it a, in a in lot a of novel. fantasy books and you, you sort of open it and it shows that there's 33 chapters and I just think, yeah, it's a long book, but I, I don't need... <laughs> Is it like a, is it, I don't know, is it some sort of creative outlet to name your chapter? Is that it? Give a strange title for it. 
I think that's a really interesting point, and it is it's somewhat creative sometimes. And some of I, I've seen some novels that have creative chapter titles that make sense, or they're thematic, or they give you some kind of arc of the journey.、Mm. And in those cases, if they're if they add something to the book, I think they're great additions. I think if they're very boring and just not really inspired, they shouldn't be in there. Yeah, and I think. I don't know. It sometimes gives it away. You look at the chapter list and you think, well, maybe I can work the story out. And so you get down to chapter <laughs> seven. Cliff notes. Yeah, yeah. but just get... in the headlines, just in the header chapter. Well, and the and it, if you look at books published in the thirties and forties,、um, the, the the chapter titles absolutely gave away the story, gave away the chapter.、Hmm. You know. Yeah, you know, so you just That's turn funny. in which in which a mysterious box is discovered. It's like, oh man, you ruined it.、That's... Yeah. It's like chapter, you know, chapter twenty three says on the home stretch. Like, right, well, they clearly got through all the other stuff. <laughs> exactly. In conclusion,、yeah. everything ends happily.、Um, Louise May Alcott's books will have titles like that, and you know, I don't know if it's because she put them in or it's because she had, you know, very well-meaning publishers who who are like, oh no, the children need to have, you know, very, these very, you know. Serious descriptions, and maybe Alcott's like rolling her eyes, saying, "Oh, please,、mm. I don't even want to write these. Please, don't make it more painful." <laughs> yeah, I think do away with the contents.、Um, yeah, I like more mysterious, and I, I and, and again, I have a, I have a publisher where you know their style is to have everything you know, chapter one, chapter two. So I said, "All right, if that's your style, that's what I sign up for." Well, let's take it even further. Why do we even need chapters, really? With e-books, you really don't when you think about it. Hmm. Anyway, let's throw that、yeah. out there and have someone. I think you need them simply because they're a break for the reader. I know, like when I'm going to bed and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to finish this chapter so that I can put my bookmark there. It gives the reader a logical place to stop.、Hmm. Or, That's true, and, and think of the lexicon. I mean, we even say, "Let me just finish this chapter." Yes. Well, how scary would it be though if they played a little sound for you to take a break? So if you're reading for half an hour. You, you swipe the page and you hear ding, ding, ding. Man, that would scare the crap out of me. <laughs> that would be something my husband would embed in my books. Ding, ding, ding. Time to look up and pay attention to your husband. <laughs> Which reminds me, I must email him again. Actually, <laughs>、uh, we can we can work on that idea. Now,、mm. Brooke, you're also a writing coach. Do you get? Do you have a, a sort of a, I don't know a stock standard facial expression when someone says, you know, what do you do? And you say. Oh, I'm I'm also a writing coach, and they come back with, "Well, I have an idea." <laughs> that happens to me every day. Does that drive you up the wall? It's a bit like when people say to me when they find out what I do. Oh, really? Well, I've got a TV that needs installing. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Okay. Give me your key. I'm just so used to it, though. Aren't you just used to it? I I think that it's part. I guess it's like a, what do they call that hazard of the occupation. Hmm. Why?、Well, I'd try and get creative, and I don't know. Maybe I overthink it too much. But there's often a thing, you know, if we're carrying something quite expensive into a job, projector, TV, whatever,、um, someone always says, "Oh, that'd look good in my house." So I usually stop and put it down and put my hand down and say, "Well, give me your keys, please, or give me your、That's、address."、Great. And they look at me like, "What?" And I usually say,、oh, "I don't care where it goes, as long as it's not with me." At the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well. You have to get. You're you're probably more creative than I am. I mean, the hard thing about being a writing coach is that part of being a coach is being supportive of people's dreams,、mm. and so it's it's not something I feel I can take lightly. If someone says to me, "Oh, I have a really great idea for a project," even though people say that to me almost every day, I go, "Great, that's awesome." And、mm. you know, sometimes I am in a position where I have to say, "I can't hear about it."、Mm. Have you been? Is that sort of your out? You, I'm just picturing you being bailed up in a corner somewhere by someone going, "I've got this idea," and it starts off with you know <laughs> these small hobbit type people, and you're just like, "I just, I just came、that's、over here." <laughs> Let me give you the whole plot because that's something else people love to do. Yeah, the whole plot. What's your out? Do you say, "Look, here's my contact details," and you're just hoping that they just. I don't know. Find another writing coach in the room. Bail lose them up. The, lose the card. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I do. I just say, you know, you'll need to follow up with me, and I gently tell them that I can't hear about their whole book in that moment. <laughs> yeah. And that. Yeah. Gotta go. Onion dips calling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god.
Oh, oh man. Now, then I'm just going to be a great segue because you're teaching a couple of classes coming up. But one thing that I get when, um, you know, people say, what do you do? I says, well, I'm a writer. And they say, oh, my life would make such a good book. And of course, my reaction is probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't say that out loud. I just give them my card and said, you know, hey, if you want to write oh. your memoirs, I can help you. Now, you've got um, a couple of classes with Linda Joy Meyer, who we have had on our show. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, the main one, it's funny because we're talking about write your write your novel in a weekend, right? Or yeah. NaNoWriMo, which is write your novel in a month. Uh, we do write your memoir in six months. So six months is a little more reasonable than Thank a weekend. You. I think so. <laughs> yeah. but, it's, but it's hard. It's really hard. And mostly what we do in that class is teach re writers about craft. But because memoir brings out so much intensity in people and so much emotion, it's also a fair amount about process. So uh -huh. that class is something that we teach every six months. And we are halfway through our fall class. And we're gearing up to really start promoting for our spring class, which starts uh, in January. And okay. the, and then we also do, uh, which I love this, this is actually really exciting, is these month-long bestseller memoir classes. So they're four-week classes, and we pick a best-selling memoir. It has to have been on the bestseller list. And so we've taught Angela's Ashes and The Liars Club uh, by Mary Carr and Wild by Cheryl Strayed and Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. And this fall, uh, next month, actually, we're teaching H is for Hawk, which is a brand new book that is really making uh, kind of an amazing splash by Helen MacDonald, a, a British writer. So what's, what sets those memoirs apart from, I don't know, just Joe Blow who thinks my life is interesting? It is something that resonates, and it's really hard. I mean, if publishers knew what that formula was, then they would all be scooping up those books. I think it's a combination of really fantastic writing, a lot of authenticity that you just connect to that character and her or his struggles, uh, and or the writing is just brilliant. There's something that you just want to read or connect with. So it's it's hard to say. I think it's a combination of things. Mm. Do they all need to have some sort of major element to them, like the person overcoming cancer or, I don't know, being locked in an attic during World War II or something? Does it need to be big on that scale? I think of all the reality TV shows at the moment where, I don't know, the only way you get on is if you're dying or had someone die <laughs> the day before. Um, uh I mean, yeah, it has to be some. There, there has to be some epic theme. It, it, sometimes it's grief. Uh, in the context of Eat, Pray, Love, though, it was really just a personal journey. She happened to do a heroine's journey that, but she had gone through a divorce, and I think it really resonated with women of mm -hmm. a certain age. Uh, you think about Julie and Julia, which was another novel that all that woman did was cook her way through Julia Child's cookbook. So you know, it's not always tragic. Um, it's again, it's hard to say. I think it just has to have that kernel of something that readers just go, "Ooh, wow, that's interesting," and it has to be something that they can wrap their mind around. Mm. So, how come Justin Bieber wrote a memoir? <laughs> how come he did? Mm. Isn't he like uh, three? I didn't think he could write. <laughs> hey, hey, he's twelve. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole reality, the the idea of reality TV people writing books is one of the biggest issues that I have with traditional publishing that they look at that as a sure bet because these people have these existing audiences and so they of course want them to publish books but it's pretty horrific because mm. I can't think of a single book that was written by a reality TV star or a pop star um, you know unless they're like they went through something major like they puberty you know, <laughs> well, there you, go. <laughs> you know you think of these people who are like they used to be celebrities and then they've had this kind of interesting life and people want to know whatever happened to them. Those are the only people I'm interested in reading their memoirs. Mm, I agree. I don't know. And they all seem to, I don't know, it's like halfway through their career. Yeah, they're only 22 and all their memoirs are titled, you know, Justin Bieber, My Life So Far. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's like, That's thanks awesome. a lot. Now, here's the other thing, because I'm, I'm curious, you might have an opinion about this. Of course, Justin Bieber isn't writing his own book. He's got ghostwriters and staff yeah. 
and all sorts of people helping him write books without those writers getting any credit. What do you, have you, have you dealt with ghost, ghost writers or ghost written books? And what do you think about that? Because I'm, I'm feeling cranky about it right now. Oh no, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have actually worked with ghost writers in the past on some books and I've also written, I, I've worked, I've known ghost writers who are cranky when a book becomes a bestseller. Uh -huh. And they don't. And get so it's it, it's hard, you know. I think that it's a job. You know, you're paid to be a ghostwriter, and then if the book has a breakout success, I'm not sure that you have the right to be pissed off about it. Mm. Um, okay. That's my opinion on that. But I also think, you know, it, yeah, it's complicated that all of these publishers want these authors who clearly are not authors. You know, they're celebrities. So mm. I, I guess I feel neutral. Okay. But okay. if you feel cranky and you want to tell the audience about that, I think that's great. I'd love to hear no, no, about no, it. No, 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 no. We've only got like 20 <laughs> minutes left. Um. <laughs> we don't it's like, no, no, he's going to turn off. No, what, what I, I, and I'm just, again, I'm just, form, I'm learning about it. And I, before I pop off with a huge opinion about it, but it just, it seems as if we're such a celebrity driven culture, which is the way it is. So there's no necessarily changing that. But you have these, you know, writers who are, you know, they're writing up the celebrity book and getting no credit for it. And, and you know, and how, unless you're getting a whole lot of money, which I don't think they are, um, I, you know, how do you, you know, how do you justify that? It's almost like, you know, we've got a little group of, of you know, people in the shadows as slave labor. It's like, you know, pump this out for 3000 so Kim Kardashian can make a lot more money. That I think they're making way more money than that. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I really think you should not worry about the people who are doing the celebrity memoirs. I mean, usually they're being, sometimes they're being hired by the celebrity themselves and they're getting like a, a lot of money. I, most of the ghostwriters okay. I know who have written for big time people are making on the low end, like 30 or 40 grand for one book. Okay. Mm. All right. I feel and, better knowing that. That's good. <laughs> But no one, no one. <laughs> Good, that's what I needed to know before I just popped off. It's, it's right. not a bad job. You know, it's the people who get pissed off are the people who ghostwrite these books that just, you know, then they go on to sell millions and they're thinking, oh my gosh, well, if I had gotten, you know, part of the royalties on that book, but that is not the contract that they signed. Hmm. Right, and that's the crapshoot about writing anything. Exactly. Hmm. No, yeah. one, no one's holding a gun to their head going, you will be a ghostwriter. <laughs> you know, they chose totally to do it. I totally get that. I totally get that. Just, just wanted to see if I was, you know, going off on the wrong kind of tangent, which it looks like I am. So that's the I'm ghostwriters of the world need support, though. So that's okay. I think it's it's good to have an advocate in you. Well, here's Very. the thing. Why would you take up ghostwriting then? Money. I was. Yeah, was money. Like, oh. And because you're a good writer who has a lot of books that you could write. I mean, you know, even very prolific writers are not getting, are not typically, unless you're like Dean Koontz or uh, Stephen King or just someone who's writing genre fiction and just pumping out one book a year or Jodi Picoult, you know, those kinds of people actually are getting like everything they publish or everything they write will get published. And there are a lot of people who are super prolific and have that kind of capacity, but they can't get traction or make money on their own books. And so those people are career writers, and I think they do pretty well ghostwriting. Huh. Okay. Well, here's a, here's a completely off-tangent question, because I'm at your website, and I thought I'd hit the About button. Um, you went to BA in International Affairs. Now, the question I've got for you is, <laughs> how did you choose that? Like, when you're looking at the course list, you're like, you know what? I'm really pissed off about Africa or something. I'm like the international <laughs> affairs as a cause. What does that involve? That is super off topic. I should probably delete that from my bio because it's so random. People are like, how did that happen? I know, I, mean, I love I, random. I studied abroad in Spain when I was in my senior year of high school. And so when I then went into college as a very young person, like Justin Bieber having no idea about <laughs> my life, hmm. uh, I thought that I would do international affairs because I loved living in Europe and I spoke Spanish and so I had no idea what I was doing and so I you know I didn't even get into book publishing until afterwards and with my BA in international affairs I got a book publishing job but what huh. I don't know there what does what does international affairs as a course cover and don't say international affairs um, <laughs> it sounds like a well, 
political. It's not a course, it's a degree. Yes. Right? And so you, you, the kinds of courses that you take are language and uh, anything you want, history, uh, politics. It's gearing you up to get a job like working with NGOs or working abroad. You, lots of people went to the Peace Corps or to the UN. I mean, I did uh. model UN. You know, you're like, a, a, you're an international citizen. Right. So it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, an arts degree for politics. That's exactly what it is. Sweet. Finally. It's people who speak a foreign language and who are well traveled, and they go, "Wow, that sounds like an awesome job. Maybe I'll live abroad someday." And then that's what yeah. they do. Huh? Well, there you go. You can do a degree in that. That's <laughs> yeah. It, it's a, it's a little bit like an English degree. Right. Except you're speaking a different language. Exactly. <laughs> What's Spain like? I've never been to Spain. Catherine's going to Spain in a few months, aren't you? Or next year? Yeah, next uh, May. Yeah. Next May. It Absolutely fantastic. So how did that come about? Obviously, you said you're in your final year. Was it something that just you know popped up on a notice board? Do you want to go to Spain? Like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I had a very close family friend growing up who did an international exchange program, and it's strange. It's like I always knew I was going to do it. Oh, right. From a really young age, and my dad spoke Spanish, and I grew up in Southern California, and I, it's interesting. It wasn't something that I really thought it's not like I arrived at that point and said, oh, that sounds interesting. It's, it really was kind of in my consciousness from so young that I always knew I wanted to go abroad. Hmm. So you could speak Spanish anyway. So that wouldn't have no. been so much. Oh, you couldn't? No, not at all. I mean, it was very sad. Uh, testament to public education that I did an AP course in Spanish and actually passed the AP course and arrived in Spain and could not understand a word anyone was saying at all. <laughs> that's because it was probably Castilian, which is different. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Can I give you some stuff on that? I don't know. I mean, a, a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> okay. I don't know. When you got there, though, Sometimes did you think, oh, what have I got myself into? I don't even know how to yes. catch a taxi. I did oh, think that many, many it's nights. It's fun to arrive someplace and say, ah, oh, what have I got myself into? Because then, then the adventure is managing what you got yourself into. I mean, that's, that's what's fun. Yeah, but there's a limit to that. I mean, if you end up, you know, with like a, a hessian sack on your head and cable ties around your wrist, you don't think, hmm, this is fun. Like, what did I get myself into? Nah, that happens so little. That's, that's just not even not even <laughs> right on. You it was a very safe environment for me because I went and lived with a family. But what I'll say is that I do think that it set me up for a lot of curiosity. You know, it's like it was an adventure. It was scary because I was young. And there's something, you know, like if you're a reader and a person who loves other people's stories, there is something just connected in all of that, the choices you make and the things that you, you know, that you're interested in doing. So I've always been... Uh, well, when I was young, I was a big traveler. Now mm. I can't anymore because I have a kid, and you don't go anywhere anymore. No. <laughs> but <laughs> no. So now I just have to armchair read. <laughs> yes, children. Um, sure. <laughs> mine, mine's currently on the couch watching YouTube. I think that's what they do now. That's uh, what they do. Heaven help you if you go outside. Um, what about you though? How did you sort of get into this? Have you, you know, have you written a book yourself? Um, and how did you go about doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I got into book publishing, like I said, after my international affairs degree, mm. <laughs> because <laughs> I wanted to come back to California. And after going to school in DC, and I loved reading and thought, well, I would be good at that job. And it just worked out for me. So that was lucky. I really did fall into book publishing. Uh, and I was in book publishing, like I said earlier, for 14 years. I mean, I just did it. Like that was my industry. That was my job. And I was fully immersed in traditional publishing. And then it was like 2008, maybe, that I was making like such bad money in publishing and living in the Bay Area and barely surviving. And I said, I have to have a supplementary stream of income or I'm just going to always be living in this crappy apartment. And one <laughs> of my friends said, you should coach because that is what your job is. You're coaching writers. And I was like, huh, wow. It was a total light bulb moment. And so I started coaching, and it was always word of mouth. And the interesting thing that happened in the coaching experience was that 
people were not coming to me primarily because they wanted to traditionally publish. They were coming to me because they wanted to self-publish. And mm. I was blown away. And it really opened my mind to the fact that traditional publishing was not the only game out there, that there were lots of people disillusioned by traditional publishing, that there were all these people who were getting rejected by traditional publishers who still believed in their books. And so I had a total, like, work around in my mind on this whole thing and and I really started becoming a champion of people who wanted to self publish and I still am to this day and the, it led to the hybrid thing because I saw that people were not self publishing well mm. ah, okay. and, and then I uh, I did publish my own book. My my book was the first book that She Writes Press ever published because I wanted to put myself through the process and make sure that I believed in it and that it was working. And that was in 2012. And now I'm about to publish my second book in um, on the spring list for She Writes Press. Cool. So because oh, the first cool. one's called What's Your Book? Uh, That's right. Step by step guide to get you from inspiration to published author. <laughs> a long title uh, um yeah it's on amazon go and check it out so what's the next one called yeah what's the next one the next one is called green light your book mm -hmm. and i haven't even memorized the subtitle yet but it's basically oh. something along the lines of how authors can be successful in the new publishing environment right go. so is that going to have a green backdrop so you've got red green you could do it <laughs> you can do an amber one in the middle has, like you look at the book and you feel like you're on stage. It's got all these like great lights and it's it's got a great cover. I'm super happy with it. And it's really about this whole thing that's going on in traditional publishing right now that uh, helping authors understand the terrain of publishing and it's coming out in, um, in June of 2016. Hmm. So how did you go about covering that step where you have to say to the inspiring author, you just actually need to write the thing? Oh, yeah. that's what I have to say. Oh, sorry, Catherine. <laughs> no, yep. but that's what yep. I have to say. Is like, Tisa, like, can I publish a book without, you know, writing it? No. Yeah. No, you can't. And then Catherine says, no, because I will not hire a ghostwriter. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's part of the inspiration, right, or the motivation. And a lot of what I do as a coach is accountability. Hmm. I mean, there are lots of people who tell me they would have never written their book if they hadn't had a coach because they just – they people don't have – the capacity to do things. I mean, like I, I am a runner and I've always felt that running is so similar to writing. Like I actually have to have someone pushing me and I have to, you know, I, I'm not very good at just going out and doing it on my own or I just jog at like a really slow pace. Mm -hmm. But if I go to track practice, I kick butt, right? Because someone is there like actually expecting me to. Mm. Yeah. And it's a similar kind of thing. I mean, people just struggle a lot around personal uh, accountability. And so that's, it, it's a big deal and it's it's very effective hmm. yeah and that's I, I i would i would agree because i have i have two clients two clients right off the top of my head who it's all about me saying how's it going how's it going now how about now and you know they have to you know because they know i'm calling them it, it helps propel them forward. that's all they want i mean sometimes i feel like that's I, i've said to people in the past my job is to hold the space yeah Hmm. I mean, really, that's that is uh, like as simple as it gets. You know, they show up, they talk, we talk about the book, and mm -hmm. they turn in a deliverable. And yes, there's other things going on, but at its root, that's really what it's about, and it's really powerful, and it's worth something. And sometimes yeah. just paying for that could probably be a good motivator. Yes. You know, oh, I'm paying for a coach, huge... and they're ringing me now, and I haven't done a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge motivator, and and by and by putting their money into it, they it it, it often. Um, help solidify their their uh, commitment to what they're doing. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but just knowing that you're, you know, you're paying out and, and you want to make sure you, you – know, I want the client to get something out of what they're paying out, right? Hmm. So you know, it, it ends up being – it's a very, you know, very mutual system. That would be awkward if you had someone you – know, they're paying you, you're ringing them, you're not getting very far, and they say, look, this isn't working. Clearly, I'm, I'm just not in the right place to you know, do this. Can I have my money back? They, they probably could, and I probably would give them their money back, but that hasn't happened. Oh, well, that's because I don't pay you. Um... <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> My coaching for you is free. I know. It's much appreciated. It hasn't got me anywhere. No. Um, it's got me... <laughs> probably far enough. Could you have anything? <laughs> now, Brooke, look, let's 
we've got a lot of newbies that listen to this show. What is that sort of one tip that you can sort of give to the, someone that has got that uh, idea and to get them started at least? Put one step in front of the other. I absolutely think the, the best and simplest thing is to schedule your writing time. I mean, every day I'm working with people who are not writing, right? Mm. Like, I just can't, I don't, something came up, the excuse list is like, you know, and, and they acknowledge it as an excuse list. And the most effective thing is, you know, whether you schedule your time in your calendar or on your phone or whatever is like to actually put that in. I think that to the, like I get um, alarms, you know, where you set the alarm and then it comes up on your phone and your iPad and your computer. And yeah. it's like scheduled writing time, <laughs> scheduled writing time. And enough times of ignoring those, you really are going to go, wow, I have a problem. You know, maybe I need <laughs> to hire someone. Maybe I need to be in a writing group. So support scheduling, you know, it's all these structures that you can set up for yourself and you want to get serious about it. It's a lot like you can join a gym, but you can just keep paying for that membership and never show up. But if you get a writing, a, a gym buddy, you know, or if you start taking a class and there's an expectation that you show up, then it, it changes things. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I could join a gym. You know, I'm I'm not fat, and I I've, I've been in gyms, and I feel massive, um, <laughs> massive and old and ugly. <laughs> anyway, um, well, that's not very motivating. No. But you do show up. I mean, we show up every Friday for the podcast, so we've got some consistency going. Yeah, see, that's it. You know, it be, it needs to become a routine. I find anything you do probably takes a good, I don't know, three weeks, maybe a month before it becomes a good routine. Uh, and that's yeah. actually a really valuable thing that you just said about the podcast is like, look at something in your life that you're doing with consistency and that you're committed to. And what is it? What are the qualities that that thing has that make you show up mm. and then try to put your writing into that space in some way? And because it's, it's all psychological, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's also, you know, there are that psychological element and it depends on one situation, you know, like mine running a business every time i think yes i get spare moment yes then the phone rings and it's mm -hmm. you know apparently it's armageddon outside or something <laughs> you know and you're like damn thwarted again i know yeah. and it's a bit like it happened yesterday i tell you i thought you know what i've got a spare moment the phone rang and someone's going we've got all these screens at a bank that have got an error on them and we've had our opening day it's like all right all right i'll be there in a minute you know like <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> then you have to start to wonder if the universe is conspiring against you. And for people like that, hmm. they have to like book a cabin in the woods and yeah. binge write for like a weekend at a time every few months. Yeah, and I hate holidays. So, you know, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I'm in so much trouble. Anyway, now, it's been a pleasure having you on. Where can people find you out on the internet? And if there's anything you want to spruik, you've got... You can do your elevator pitch right now. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, I have my coaching practice is warnercoaching.com. And as I was talking about my classes earlier, that's kind of the main thing that I'm interested in putting out to people who are memoirists. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can find that at writeyourmemoirinsixmonths.com. Mm -hmm. And then for... Hmm? Really? That is the <laughs> longest, I think, <laughs> that's the longest URL we've ever come across. <laughs> I know you have to really sit down there and like type out each of those words. It's it's a lot, but if you go into Google, I love Google because you don't have to deal with URLs. You just like your your fingers just fly, and you'll find it. I'm trying awesome. to write this now. And then. She writes, of course, for people who are interested in understanding more about hybrid publishing or want to look into that or are interested in submitting, SheWritesPress.com uh, really lays out exactly what we do. But I seriously recommend Googling and looking, and I blog on HuffPost, and so if some of the stuff you were interested in today, like returns or other things, I have all kinds of information about that. So, um, yeah, it's just like all over the place, but thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to say it. Oh, that's all right. Now, we've got a few things that we need to do. Please stick around. Um, we, t I don't know, we, do a, we do a prompt. What do you, what's your thoughts on prompts to get people started? Uh, great. I, I'm a believer. Oh, you're a believer. Some people aren't. 
Um, I don't know why. It's just their own <laughs> thing. Um, this prompt here is, what do you love to do so much that you forget everything else? Write about a character who's so involved in his or her flow that their world could collapse around them and they would not notice. Not that this is born of personal experience, Catherine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, which I did have a sort of, you know, bit of imagining when I heard on the news that, I don't know, half of California seems to be on fire. Yes. Um, and I just pictured Catherine sitting at a desk typing away and looking out the window going, thought it was warm in here. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what it looks like. And I just, I was, um, and the reason this came up is I was doing the, the beta, I was, I was folding in all the beta information, all the beta reader information into the future run manuscript. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, I got obsessed again and I just really, everything just goes away while I'm, while I'm focused on that. But, um, I finished it and I sent it off to the publisher. So pretty happy that that, you know, that piece is done, but yeah, that's what I thought. Oh man, there could be a fire and I'd be banging out the last four chapters. Just another chapter. <laughs> You'd be that person. I've seen there's a, there's a photo on the net, you know, in those memes of someone being rescued from a fire down a, um, a fireman's ladder, you know, big tall thing, and he's got his computer under his arm. Yeah. Um, oh, the computer no, would for definitely sure. sink. <laughs> I love the way you're both like, yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> That's your life. Shit. Anyway. Save the dog, save the computer. That's pretty much what we got. <laughs> Probably the computer that started in the first place. Um... Let's do a tortured sentence. Let's do a tortured sentence. Next time, don't put the rain farces on the rocket slab. <laughs> tortured sentences. Now I had I had Brooke record that. That was her being bailed <laughs> up by someone with an idea at a function. <laughs> anyway, now And I had an Aussie accent, it's weird. I know. I don't know how, well, it's the international affairs, you managed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> please take, yeah, please take the Australian accent course down in room 112. Um, <laughs> imagine that, a guy in just a trucky shirt and shorts with his leg up on the table going, all right. They would do me. it to get the ladies, though. You reckon? Oh, yeah. yeah. The Americans have a real thing for Aussies. Yeah. Well, just yeah. the accent. Yeah, I don't know. You know that because our American guests love your accent. Yeah, it's the pulling power of the show. Come and listen to me talk for an hour. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, you know, keeps me showing up. It's all good. <laughs> Leaving that alone. Why? Where did this sentence come from? Moving on, changing. The well, as, as you, I think that having students wrestle with Jonathan Swift's modest proposal has really been fruitful for the show because they just can't get their heads around how to articulate this particular essay. So this is in response to modest proposal. And uh, the sentence is, back in the early 1700s, Ireland's resources were sadly dimin diminutive. Mm. But there's a typo. Was oh yeah, resources is spelled a different way, yes. <laughs> That actually says rescores. It almost looks like recourses. Mm, but with that, you say, yeah, Ireland's rescores. It's like they were trying to hit. We scored again. Anyway. Re -sc the soccer teams are doing very badly. The rescores were sadly to me. <laughs> yeah. That makes more sense. Yep. That's right. <laughs> they, were, they were scoring goals in, for the other team. Um, <laughs> that makes much more sense. <laughs> all right. Well, let's do, let's do a word of the week. Now... I've heard of this word before. Where did this one come from? This is the layout word of the day, I think. Um, the lie. To give a false impression or misrepresent. Oh, <laughs> like this show. Um, <laughs> to, to show to be false or contradict. Belie. Yes, I've heard of belie. That's not a strange word. What are you doing? Anyway. I don't know. Just looked like a good word. Comes from the old English belogan. That's a cool word. Oh, I'll be That's to be deceived by li by lying, you be Logan. It's I'm, almost like you be Logan to me, which which totally gives a different. Meaning. I'd love to hear that in a rap song. Yeah, we be Logan. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> now, Brooke, is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? Oh my gosh. 
I'm put, I am put on the spot. I, have, I, I The thing is, I just have to give a shout out to all of the She Writes Press authors because they're all so amazing and they work so hard and we have a real democracy at She Writes Press, which I love. And so you can follow She Writes Press on Facebook and Twitter. So that would be my shout out and request. Well, there you go. Catherine, is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? Maybe the fireman that stopped the fire getting into your house while you're working? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, um, I'll give a shout out to um, the uh, doctors at Kaiser who just, I just had my uh, wrist um, x-rayed right before the show and everything's healed. So now Sweet. I can like function more or less like I used to. So I'm pretty happy about that. Cool. Back to backhanding. <laughs> more um, typing. Yeah. Yeah, I, definitely more typing. <laughs> I don't normally give shout outs on this show, but I would like to give a shout out to the lady. I don't know her name that was at a... We had a job at a medical center fixing a phone line and I she came I was standing in a hallway and she came out of an office and she went, Oh and I said, Sorry. She goes, Oh you you look like oh you look like that guy fr- oh that's friends with Ricky Gervais. What's his name? <laughs> and I said, Stephen Merchant. She goes, Yes, you do. You look like Stephen Merchant. I said, oh, that's wonderful to know. She goes, mmm, not a bad thing, and shut the door. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so thank that's you. awesome. Yeah, thanks for that, that lady. That is awesome. <laughs> so I looked like someone that she couldn't place a name to, so clearly I feel sorry <laughs> for Stephen Merchant. He's always the tag along. Anyway. Uh, he might be like the Ghost Riders and he's making just enough money to make it worthwhile. I think he's making a lot of money to make it worthwhile. So yes, I don't know. Tall, tall and lanky and oddly awkward, obviously gets you somewhere these days. Well, clearly it does. It does. All right. So that'll do it for this week. Thanks, Brooke, for being on. Um, who, thank you both. Who have we got oh, on uh, thank next you week? For coming on. Who's on next week? Next week is. Next week, next week, next week. I headed up, and then I was uh, Whitney Keys, um, author. Ah, cool. We'll talk about what she does. All right. Well, until next week, we'll see you then. See you then. Your book starts here on the Newbie Writers Podcast.